eternal and everlasting God, give to us those desires that we that will please you. Give us those thoughts in which you delight. Cause us to understand and bring pleasure to your high throne. We bless you for your provision of the mediation and merits of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Verse 3 of hymn 717. Let music swell the breeze and ring from all the trees. Sweet freedom song. Let mortal tongues awake. Let all that breathe partake. Let rocks their silence break. The sound prolong. Well, we've got an article here um, written from the American Old Testament scholars um, from the journal JSTOR Old Testament um, volume 9 I don't have a date on that publication date take that back wow 18 July 1 1889 uh, can it be that old Anyways, it's written by Prof. J. F. McCurdy of the University or of Toronto, Canada. I presume he's maybe Knox College or possibly um, Wycliffe. It's American Old Testament scholar William Henry Green. William Henry Green, senior professor in the Theological Seminary of Princeton, New Jersey was born at Groveville, Groveville, Burlington County, New Jersey, January 1825. His father, a prominent lumber merchant of Trenton, died in 1883 at the age of 85. <clears throat> His mother in 1843, in her 39th year, oh, so she died young. Of his near relatives, many have attained a distinguished place in the business and professional world, especially in law and mercantile affairs. None of them, however, except the subject of the present sketch, has, we believe, devoted himself either to the ministry or to exact scholarship, though their active interest both in theological and sec secular education has long been known far and wide. Professor Green was, as a lad, remarkably remarkable for the early development of his powers and for his successful application of serious study. After attending English schools at Groveville and Lawrenceville, New Jersey, he spent two years in the famous classical school of Reverend John Vanderveer in Easton, PA. In the spring of 1837, when was he born? 25. 1825, 1837, what did we say, 25, yeah, he entered a f the freshman class of Lafayette College in Easton, he's 12 years old, and after taking the full course was graduated there in 1840 at the age of 15. The institution was then under the presidency of Dr. George Junkin. Wow, he ends up where William, what is it, in born in Lexington? Whoa, what did they check Junkin? His, 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 grave, his grave is in Lexington. Yeah, and Stonewall Jackson, I think, married his daughter. And among Dr. Green's teachers in classics, there was a professor, J.C. Moffat. Afterwards, his colleague and now Professor Emeritus of Church History at Princeton Seminary. One of his favorite studies in these early years was mathematics, a pursuit in which he gained distinction, showing a combination of tastes and talents, which had, has been paralleled, for example, by another distinguished biblical scholar, R. R. W. R. Robertson Smith. After his graduation, he remained two years at Lafayette College as a tutor of mathematics. In 1842, 
He's 17 years old. He entered Princeton Seminary as a student of theology, but after a year's study at the age of 18, he went back to Lafayette as a professor of mathematics. Returning after one year's service to his theological studies, he graduated from the seminary in 1846 at age 21. Among his classmates <coughs> were Dr. A. A. Hodge, afterwards his colleague, Dr. T. L. Kyler, and Dr. H. J. Von Dyke of Brooklyn. Upon his graduation, he was appointed assistant teacher of Hebrew, a position which he retained three years, at the same time being pretty constantly occupied in preaching, as he su supplied successfully for lengthened periods of both Presbyterian churches of the town of Princeton. In 1849, he was called to the pastorate of Central Presbyterian Church of Philadelphia at age 24. My goodness. Here he ministered two years, keeping up his special studies, as we may infer from the appearance in 1850 of his first contribution to Princeton Review, a long article on the composition and contents of the Book of Joshua, suggested by the commentary of Kyle, who had just been, which had just been issued. In 1851, he was elected pr professor, 26 years old, of biblical and oriental li literature in Princeton Seminary, taking the place of Professor J.A. Alexander, who'd been transferred to the Department of Church History. Kind of a nepotistic little group up there. A lot of young guys had been transferred to the Department of Church History. He was relieved of New Testament instruction in 1859. At 34 years old. Yeah. Having been made then Professor of Oriental and Old Testament Literature. And the stuff we've got from him is the late 1890s. So it's like He's had 30, 35, 40 years of Hebrew development. Um, for many years, he taught all the Hebrew, of, of course, with the elements of the cognate Aramaic and Arabic languages, as these were demanded. In addition to the owner's duties of Old Testament introduction and exegesis, since 1873, was after the Civil War, regular instruction was provided for the linguistic department, and now all the work directly or indirectly connected with the Old Testament in the hands of three ordinary professors. Under the older system, his many pupils had undoubtedly a very great advantage in receiving both their linguistic and exegetical instruction from the same teacher, and that one of the most enthusiastic faithful and successful Hebrew instructors of the time, but large and steadily increasing demands of the total work were too much to be justly put upon one man. The gradual expansion of the Old Testament teaching faculty in Princeton may help to illustrate the modern development of the science of study in America. Dr. Green's work as an author began with the publication in 1850 of the article referred to above. His contributions of the same class to the press were for many years very, very numerous. Apart from occasional newspaper articles and an ingenious and suggestive The Life of Prophet Hosea in the short-lived Cincinnati periodical or monthly, January and February 1871, most of them appeared in the old biblical repertory repertoire and Princeton Review. The list is too long to be here given in full, but a selection from the titles may indicate the breadth of interest and extent of his researches. Besides those, I'm going to enlarge this just a touch. Will that work? Yeah, that'll work. Uh, the Jews at Kyung Fu 1854, origin, origin of Writing, 1855, 
monuments of the Umbrian language, demotic grammar, comparative accentual system of Sanskrit and Greek, sacred writings of the Parsis, Spiegel's Pelvi grammar, <laughs> Albania and its people, modern philology, 1866, relations of India to Greece. The articles on biblical subjects embrace nearly all the topics included in Old Testament introduction, only one of them dealing with the New Testament, namely in 1854, Ebrard on the Apocalypse. In one form or another, they range over a large part of the Old Testament, the prophets and poetical books being the most prominent. The most important titles relating to general topics may be mentioned. 1851, Kurtz on the Old Testament. I think that it's something over here by him. History of the Old Testament. The Money of the Bible, 1858. Hoffman's Prophecy Fulfillment, 59. Christology, Old Testament Idea of the Prophet. 1861, Fulfillment of Prophet. 1862, The Matter of Prophecy. Davidson's Introduction to the Old Testament, 1865, Structure of the Old Testament, 1866, Dr. Williams' New Translation of Hebrew Prophets, 1878, Kenan on the Prophets and Prophecy in Israel, and the Presbyterian Review appeared in 1882, Professor Robert Robertson Smith on the Pentateuch, 1886, The Critics of the Revised Version of the New Test Old Testament. Dr. Green's first publication book form was his Hebrew Grammar, 1861. Grace Grammar has been familiar to a whole generation of Hebrew students and has appeared within the last few months in an enlarged, improved form, the syntax being, in fact, an entirely new treatise. In 1864, he published his Hebrew Christomathy, sort of like an anthology. <clears throat> selections of extracts from the Old Testament with grammatical and exegetical notes, familiar to all Princeton students and to many others. His elementary Hebrew grammar with reading lessons, perhaps used by a greater number than the larger treatise, was issued in 1866. It is one of the most convenient language manuals to be found anywhere and has been much improved in successive editions. This closes the list of his linguistic publications. His first controversial work appeared in 1863. The Pentateuch vindicated from the aspersions of Bishop Colenso. It was not until 1883 that his most widely known polemic treatise was issued, Moses and the Prophets. I wonder what Charles Briggs was doing, containing the articles upon Kenan and Smith above mentioned and a separate review of Smith on the prophets of Israel. The Hebrew feasts in the relation to the recent critical hypotheses concerning the Pentateuch, perhaps the most learned and able of all his books, form the Newton Lectures for 1885 and was published the same year. We didn't get any of this in the two schools, three schools I went to. His discussion of the Pentateuchal question with Professor Harper now going on in Hebraic is known to all scholars. Strictly exegetical work he has not undertaken on a large scale. He has, however, translated and edited with important editions, Ockler's exposition of the Song of Solomon for the American edition of Lang's commentary. The argument of the book of Job Unfolded is the most practically useful of useful of his publications, and though popular in style, gives the results of many years of close study. The critical notes on the Old Testament international le lessons written for the Sunday School Times, as well as his contributions to a valuable Bible manual for popular instruction are worthy of mention as illustrations of his desire and power to make the results of scholarship accessible to the people at large. Professor Green received the degree of DD from the College of New Jersey in 1857 and that of LLD from Rutgers College in 1873. He was also honored with the degree of DD from the University of Edinburgh in 1884 in connection with its tercentenary celebration. 
1868, he was elected president of the College of New Jersey, but declined the position. He was chairman of the American Committee of the Old Testament Revision, and since the conclusion of its labors has had foremost place in vindicating the methods and results of the whole work. It is as yet too early to estimate the total influence of Professor Green upon scholars and Bible students. It is sufficient to say in the meantime that it is very conservative and both wide and strong. It is not difficult to analyze his influence and show the sources of his power. Seldom have nature and fortune combined to furnish a man so well for the dependent defense of opinions formed in youth, intellectual modesty that's in his writings, and deferential to the very highest degree. The views of his early teachers were embraced by him with ardor and retained with tenacity. This is less to be wondered at when it is considered that he early came under the intellectual and moral sway of two of most remarkable personalities in the history of American education, Charles Hodge and Joseph Addison Alexander, the former for half a century, the most influential defender of old school theology, and the latter for a quarter of a century, the most accomplished scholar of the Presbyterian Church. For one of his from one of his dogmatic views received their permanent stamp, and to the other he learned to look for guidance in matters of biblical interpretation, as well as scholarly methods and tastes. Naturally, in the department which Professor Green has chosen, had, has chosen so he was still alive when this came out, and it's in the present tense, so this is 1899, has chosen for his life, the influence of Professor Alexander was more marked and direct. But in a broad estimate, one needs to take into account the whole genius and environment of Princeton of the first half of this century, be 1812 to 1850. The qualities of modesty and conservatism combined with energy, fervor, and devotion to his principles have made him a strong defender of the views and the system with which he has been identified. While too diffident of himself to parade as an exegete, his loyalty to the ideas that have become so fixedly his own make him, in the first place, a controversialist, and the next, a most powerful and formidable one, unquestionably the first in rank and influence of that sturdy band of trained scholars who still maintain, for example, the unity of the book of Moses and Isaiah. With these qualities of nature and education must be taken into account certain accomplishments and mental gifts possessed by Dr. Green in an eminent degree. He has an unsurpassed familiarity with the matter of old, the Old Testament he shows such ingenuity and dexterity, combining scattered facts and utilizing indirect allusions for the illustration as well as direct proof of the particular views he may be advocating, that the attention of scholarly readers must be once more arrested, not merely by the learning and ability of the apologist, but also by the unexpected evidence he adduces for the defensibility of his theories. He also has much aptness in illustrating by striking figures or from actual and possible parallels the tenableness of his own position and the absurdity or inconsistency of those of his opponents. See, for example, in Moses and the Prophets, Sarcasm and indignation, which abounded in this book against Bishop Colenso, are far less frequent in his later polemical writings, though not entirely absent from them. Clearness and copiousness of diction serve to make his sentences readable as well as more forcible. His works, even those not of a popular character, may therefore be read with pleasure by unprofessional readers. 
on the score of readableness, at least he affords a marked contrast to one with whom he has frequently been compared as the Hengstenberg of America. It is to be hoped that Dr. Green will yet give to the world what was at once looked for from him, a compendium of his labors in the Old Testament introduction. <clears throat> in this department, his skill of arrangement and forceful presentation have always made him a strong and impressive lecturer. With regards to his laborers in Hebrew philology and grammar, the ripest fruit result of which has lately been given to the world and upon the whole very favorably received, it is su sufficient to say that they betray the same general intellectual quality as other writings, a steadfast and exclusive adherence to what is proved or supposed to be provable and capable of practical use in education, along with great clearness and presentation of facts. Among those who do not seek to trace or indicate the genetic or historical development of Hebrew grammatical forms, Dr. Green's eclectic, long-tested practical system is the most usable, usable, and his grammar, therefore, from that point of view, probably the best existing of the elaborate treatises. As a teacher, Prof. Green, Professor Green's most conspicuous traits are his energy and self-abandonment to the subject. His interest in his pupils, abundantly manifested outside the classroom, is only less marked there because the other qualities are so conspicuous and completes the picture of one who realizes the best sense of the old word, master. Dr. Green is also noted as a preacher of this department of his many-sided activity. It is only necessary to say here that his expositions and applications of scripture are marked by a rare combination of simplicity, strength, and practicalness. It may not be out of place in this sketch by an old pupil and former associate to attempt to indicate the personal qualities of the one who was so striking a figure among the biblical educators of the time. Dr. Green's character is one of perfect simplicity and transparency. He is of a retiring disposition, naturally shrinking from notice and still more from praise, wholly devoid of personal ambition, undemonstrative in ordinary circumstances, but of warm feelings and sympathies, unobtrusive in his opinions, but expressing them freely when the need of others or the cause of right seems to demand utterance, of military devotion to duty and chivalric loyalty to truth, strong opinions on vital matters, and in these somewhat deficient inaptitude of intellectual sympathy, yet personally tolerant of all who in humility and sincerity seek the light. His force of character, the product of simplicity of nature, singleness of purpose, fervor of spirit, this is an iconium, isn't it? along with manifold intellectual gifts, had made him a tower of strength to the institution, which has been the scene and center of his labors for nearly half a century. And while other names before his had been written large upon its walls, the men of this time have learned through him also to think deferentially and reverently of Princeton. Here ends that. That was excellent. Thank you. Um, we'll end with uh, verse four of this national hymn. Our Father's God to thee, author of liberty, to thee we sing. Long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might, great God, our King. Let us pray. Lighten our darkness, O Lord, we beseech thee, by thy great might and mercy. Protect and defend us from the perils and dangers of this night, for the sake, glory, and honor of your Son, our only mediator and advocate, Jesus. Amen. Godspeed.